Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Bill Fournier, and I uh, facilitate the Library History Group. And shout out an invitation to a, what we call a hometowner, you know? Uh, one of the good old boys from Windsor Lodge. Old? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Of man, of not a few words, yeah. um, <laughs> graciously produced a book on the history of Windsor Locks, none other than Neville Montemurlo, who traveled up here from Maryland to be with us. Yeah. So I think he deserves a medal. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank to a chair. It is, I, I can't tell you how, how good it is to, to, to be here. I, you know, some, some of you know me from the old days. And uh, I was born in Springfield, but my parents live here in Windsor Locks, across from the Catholic school of St. Mary's. And uh, so I lived here from 43 till 60 when I went to college. And I was in the university system for 10 years, and during 60 to 70, I came back a lot. Two of those years were at the University of Connecticut, so I was real close by. And then uh, uh, I met my wife, Mary Beth, who was in the back, and we went off and started a career, careers. And uh, so from 1970 on, I get back to Windsor Locks once or twice a year, and I uh, you know, always look forward to it. You can take the boy out of Winslow Locks, but you can't take Winslow Locks out of Winslow Locks. <laughs> right. uh, so I, we, we, uh, we've lived in maybe a dozen places uh, in our careers uh, from oh, Florida up to uh, New York, and uh, almost always in small towns. And we retired, we were living, I worked 35 years for NASA in Washington, D.C. We lived outside of Washington in a little town called Burke. And uh, it was a nice place to bring up kids. We had a great life. And uh, after we re retired, you find that this area around Washington, D.C. is very trafficy. <laughs> round, you, know, you wake up at midnight, and there's a traffic jam. And uh, so it was a great place to bring up family. And we did. And we, we had a great time. Our best said, why don't we go live near the children? And I said, we have three. One's in the state of Washington, one's in the state of California, and one's in the state of Maryland. She said, state of Maryland. <laughs> so we moved up next to, uh, next to near, about five miles from our daughter and son-in-law and uh, the kids. And so we do a lot more babysitting now, and uh, it's easier the second time around. <laughs> but uh, this town called Bel Air, Maryland is you know, quite, quite interesting. It reminds me of Windsor Locks in the 1940s. What I mean by that is, it's a small town, and everybody knows everybody. And if you insult somebody, you know, it'll get back to them by the end of the day. <laughs> and they still, so nobody does. <laughs> they, we still have a, a large number of farms, working farms, within the town limits, okay? So it, uh, I feel very at home at Bel Air. I feel very at home in Wedgelox, and uh, I'm glad to be back to see uh, Folks like Hawaiian uh, Hawaii, who I grew up near, uh, and you know, some some friends of I'm saying kind of old friends, they're friends from long standing, and, and to see a lot of the new friends that I made when I decided to write this book, and these friends I made, um, I stopped to think, uh, I had no idea how all this would go, and uh, it turns out that. I met on Facebook a lot of people who were interested in Winter Locks history, and that's where I got the idea to start doing some articles. And uh, from that came the book. And so I've made a lot of friends uh, from people who have discussed the book with, and a lot of them I've already met here tonight. And it is really, really good to see them. And it's very hard to stand up and talk to a bunch of experts about something. <laughs> you are Winter Locks. Anyway, 
Uh, in 2016, uh, someone said, hey Mel, have you ever heard about uh, these Facebook pages that are called, uh, you know you're from Windsor Locks when? Or the Windsor Locks Historical Society? And I said, no. I went and saw them. And I saw these people talking about the Windsor Locks that I remember, and uh, they were having a good time, we're putting pictures up, putting stories up. And uh, I said, I got, got to be a part of this. So I started getting in on it, and uh, I said, I got to organize some of this. So I put together an article, and uh, I called Mickey Danler. And uh, turns out Mickey was happy to help. And when I say help, I sent him, I guess, almost all the chapters when I had to come up with a pretty good draft, and he made sure there were no errors in there. And, uh, offered me help in terms of where to find various things. So, Vicki, thank you very much. <laughs> and that was great. Uh, and I got into it, and uh, it was it was fun. And my mother, Lena Montemarillo, a lot of you may remember, uh, taught history at uh, Windsor Locks Middle School. And uh, I think that's where I sort of got the bug. And as I was writing these articles, I sort of imagined my mother yelling at me, Heck with the articles. Write a book. <laughs> so I said, well, let's give it a shot. And uh, it, it's interesting. Uh, when you first think about writing a book, you, you say, I don't know everything. I don't know anything. What, what software package should I use to write this thing? How do you get a book published? How do you get a book copyrighted? How do you find somebody who can print it? How many copies are you going to need printed? Is anybody going to buy it? <laughs> should, should you just put it on, uh, say, on the web and let them download it? Uh, what do I do? How do you figure any or all of this out? And uh, you get scared. And it turns out all first-time authors go through the same thing. You, you, you get a little, hmm, what do I do? And I called Phil Devlin. And uh, Phil wrote that great book on uh, Dr. Carnelian. And he said, you know, Mel, I went through all those problems, and don't worry about them, they'll all go away. He said, I'll, I'll tell you about some good uh, places to get stuff printed, and as far as numbers, you know, we'll figure that out. And he was right. Most of those problems just went, they went more easily. And then as the, as the articles came along, it, uh, it became uh, fun. And how do you start? First a thought, when I was so nicely asked by Bill to come and talk tonight, I'm thinking, who could, who could be in the audience? <laughs> and I'm thinking, possibly three types of people. And I'm thinking now there's only two. <laughs> but what one type are uh, historians. And there are Winslow historians right here in the audience. And uh, another type might be, but I don't see any, kids from the uh, middle school uh, history club. And uh, there are any here tonight, right? OK, I can tell better jokes. <laughs> <laughs> and others are what I call normal citizens, <laughs> non-historians. And how could I say something that might be useful and fun for all, all three groups? And the answer is, one of the main things I learned in, in writing the book was where to find information. And the longer I went on, the more I found from other people and from, from working about myself. About 20 places to find uh, good information. I got a handout here, uh, so I'm going to take any notes. Not that anybody has a pencil. <laughs> uh, now, what I found is, if, if I had this set of 20 uh, websites when I was writing the book, I think I could have written it six months rather than two years. I mean, once you, you figure out where to find information, Life becomes a lot easier, so I'll pass that out, and uh, hopefully some folks can use that. And I thought, well, it's obvious how the historians could use it, and the middle school historians, but how about normal people? Well, I, I used to be a normal person. <laughs> and uh, one of the first things I did was look myself up in the Windsor Locks Journal. And uh, what did I find? I found that I won a couple of prizes over at what's now called Pacey Park. You know, it used to be the public park. When you build things during the summer, you, you won some swimming events over at the, the pool. And you, you look up, you know, look up your mother or your father. I thought, 
my mother's engagement stuff in there. My mother's engagement, <laughs> there it was, right in front of me, okay? I gotta tell you, that was, that was fun. And then I found the write-up on, you know, when they got married, and uh, I looked up my, my grandparents. And so, any normal citizen can get on Google and give that a shot, and then get on the Winslow Life Journal archives, then give it a shot, and you find very interesting, fun stuff. I looked up, I found some stuff about Vito Colapietro, and uh, stuff that I knew. Then I found out he, he got arrested twice. <laughs> <laughs> then I read farther, and I found out that there were two Vito Colapietro. <laughs> 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 it was the other one who got arrested twice. Uh, anyway, so uh, if you haven't done it yet, uh, when I give this out, it has on it all of the websites to look at, including Winslock's uh, journal archive. Uh, and they're a uh, hoop to use and no work. Now, after you use it two or three times, you'll get faster at it because uh, you just a couple things you've got to learn, but they're easy enough. So I recommend everybody do that. It's, it's a couple of funny things. Uh, and that's not, that is real research. I mean, it, it's, that's what it's all about. It's fun. So, what's the first thing you do when you, when you decide to write the uh, history of a small town? The first thing to do is to find out everything has been written already <laughs> and read it. So it turns out there's a book by uh, a guy by the name of uh, Henry Stiles that was written in 1865, which Winslow Lux was very young at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was called The History and Genealogies of Ancient Windsor. But he has a chapter on Windsor Locks, and there are some other stuff. Uh, a little bit difficult to read, uh, very thick. 2,400 pages, <laughs> but uh, the you know, part of Winslow's was early. And then I found another book uh, called Historical Sketches uh, that was written by uh, Jabez uh, Haskell uh, Hayden in 1900. And uh, that is much smaller, much easier to read, except Mickey told me that you're going to have problems, that he was right. <laughs> uh, that when you read it, you find that he's using terms like Center Street and Main Street and you can't put this all together. And the reason is, Center Street, Main Street, all that didn't look like it does now. And so if you had a map, it would be easier. But still, it's, it's a fun, easier read. But then again, he published it. Winslow McCherrill published it in 1900. That was a long time ago. Uh, and I found some other uh, publications, like uh, during the Bicentennial and the Centennial celebrations, uh, there were pamphlets put together. And there are some very nice uh, histories of Windsor Locks. But when you look at them, they're only about 12 pages long. So if you take three or 400 years and you put them in 12 pages, it's kind of thin. So I, I, I looked at all this, and I made a list of everything I found. And uh, I uh, put it on the website. I, I did it for my own purposes. And uh, the website is windsorlockshistory.com. <laughs> if you ever want to look up and see what all those books are, you can download them for free from there. The ones that are downloadable, others that are there if you ever want to look them up. So the first thing you do is you, you make a list of all those things, and you read them. That's the easy part. What I found was that the next thing I had to do was swim in them. What, does that, what do I mean by swim in them? You had to read them, and then you have to go and think and make notes and read them again and look things up. And you keep swimming around until you start seeing the same things in your mind a couple of times, and things start hanging together a little bit. Not that you know everything, but it's just that you, you, you're starting to get a feel of the flavor of things. And so those, the, those two books were the main ones. There was a bunch of other things. So what's the, the third thing you do? After you've you found the books and pamphlets and you, you swim around in a little while, the next thing you have to do is to think, OK, how many thousand volumes would I like to write? The answer is maybe one. <laughs> and so how do I take everything that's out there and figure out what's important? I found that to be about the most difficult thing. You, you, you read all this and you say, what's most important? So I, I came up and I said to myself, you know, the hardest question I could ask about Windsor Locks history is, what are the seven or eight things which caused Windsor Locks to turn out to be the way it is right now? an interesting question. If, the, if four of us tried to write down answers, we wouldn't come up with the same answers. It's the same answer, the same apple. We would just slice it different ways. And we would have some different biases on what might be important. But for talking, 
and for understanding, it's a good way to start. And so I made a list. And for what it's worth, here they are. You said to think of settlers. When I think of settlers, I don't know what you think of settlers are. I think of settlers are brave people, mostly farmers. And they go and they find some land and they settle and farm. Well, we have those, okay? But we also had a couple of settlers who were high tech for the time. What does that mean? They knew about mills. They know how to build a mill. They know how to run a mill. That's cool. And so we had three early mills. One of them turned out to be the Dexter family, and it turned out to be C.H. Dexter Company, which was the biggest employer in Windsor Locks for a long period of time. So the fact that we had high tech, some high tech people who were into mills in the early days had a big thing on Windsor Locks. The next was two of these settlers had very nice fathers. <laughs> Ephraim Haskell and Seth Dexter of Rochester, Massachusetts bought their kids 160 acres of land. That was not, my father never bought me 160 acres. <laughs> <laughs> but, but these two did. And they, uh, it, was, it was, what they picked out was kind of neat. The land goes from Center Street down to the river and Grove Street to School Street. They bought them downtown Windsor Locks. <laughs> <laughs> not too bad, okay. And that had some effect on what happened later, okay. So, the next thing that happened, no, these aren't in chronological order. These are the way I think of them. We can blame on God. God created the earth. And when she did, <laughs> she made a river and called it the Connecticut River. <laughs> and up around Enfield, she put some falls. <laughs> and if you wanted to sail up the river or down the river, you got stuck you know, when you got to Enfield, okay? So some group of entrepreneurs said, we need to make a canal to get around those darn you know, uh, falls. And uh, they did, and they built the canal. So if it wasn't for Enfield Falls, they're never put in a bunch of blocks. There, there, there's something, something to that, OK? And uh, uh, when you think of the, the canal, one of the things that happened was they built a canal for transporting people and goods up and down, right? Right. But then the railroad came through and it was much easier to use the railroad. But the canal offered something else, water power. So when they figured water power, a bunch of entrepreneurs, some from Windsor Lock, some from Connecticut, some from New York, some from other places, decided to build some mills. And so those mills grew up along the canal, and something happened. The mills grew in number and in power and capacity and went way up, and then they went down to one. Okay. And this happened across the entire United States. This wasn't a Windsor Locks phenomenon. This was manufacturing in the United States. After a while, the United States got more out of manufacturing into service and shipped manufacturing over to uh, other, other countries where labor was cheaper. And that had a big effect on, on Windsor Locks. Okay? These things are not good or bad that I'm bringing up now. I think of them as things that, that cost. Okay? And uh, so we had these mills. And the mills needed something interesting. They needed labor, unskilled labor. Who came to fill the unskilled labor jobs? The immigrants. Okay. Uh, so the immigrants came from all over Europe. And uh, they uh, came here and uh, worked in mills and uh, made some pretty good lives and uh, some pretty good careers and left us with some funny names like Montemarillo. <laughs> and, uh, that, that the immigrant thing was a big thing in West Box, obviously. Uh, then, after, after that, let's thank the state of Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> they built the interstate, they built a, a system of highways, including 91. By the way, Mary Beth and I traveled on 91, and we got stuck at the same place we call this get stuck on the street. <laughs> but Waterbury's a nice town. <laughs> and, <laughs> but what, what, uh, what I-91 and the highway system did was to change the nature of Windsor Locks. In the early days, you lived in Windsor Locks, you slept in Windsor Locks, you worked in Windsor Locks, you shopped in Windsor Locks. You didn't need a car. I mean, even in the 40s when I was growing up, a lot of families didn't have cars. I mean, you lived on Grove Street, you didn't need a car. <laughs> My father worked three different mills at, on uh, the... Uh, I went along the canal. See, he went to and then he went to uh, Winslow's Paper Corporation, then finally to Dexter's. And, you know, 
we, we had a car, but you didn't really need it. With, so you had a certain type of town. But with the highway system, you could live somewhere else and work in Windsor Locks. You could live in Windsor Locks and work somewhere else. So I believe that had a big effect on the nature of Windsor Locks. And then we got somebody, if you want to make a list of people to thank, Dexter Drake Coffin. Dexter Drake Coffin was an aviation uh, aficionado. And he heard that they were going to build a, uh, uh, an airport, an air, a military air base, maybe at Brainerd Field. And he said, no, 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 they're going to build it in Windsor Locks. And he went and convinced the powers that be. By the way, I'm saying all this very fast. These things took a lot of time and a lot of work. Yeah. Okay. He, he, he convinced the powers that be to, to build it in Windsor Locks. We got Bradley Field. Talk about changing the nature of Windsor Locks. Okay. You could use winter locks. You could use something like that with what's going on with the mills. Uh, so, along with Bradley Field, then came the aerospace companies that along with it. And so we're up to number seven, and then there was number eight, and number eight, which changed the, the face of winter locks anyway, was uh, to me in my mind. Um, and by the way, I'm going to give these to you and uh, pass this out. And over the next week, month, year, two years, come up with one, two, three, four, five, what do you think things caused, you know, Windsor Locks to, to become what it is? Mm -hmm. I, my email address is mel at windsorlockshistory.com. Mel at windsorlockshistory.com. And, you know, send with me. I'd, I'd like to make a better list. And the way to get a better list is to get some conversations going. So think of this as a conversation starter and as something which I use to help me figure out what a table of contents should look like. Because <laughs> you can write a book, you need to figure out what you're going to talk about. And these, uh, these help. The 1965 to 70, which were my sort of last years around here, was when the Main Street Redevelopment Project came. And uh, the town fathers uh, noticed that the, the buildings and the businesses were getting old and a bit decrepit. And so they thought, why don't we get some money that came from the federal government. It's always difficult, federal money. But use it to, uh, to buy up these stores and buildings and tear them down and they'll be replaced by new buildings and new stores. In the first half of that work, they bought up the buildings, they tore them down, and not much, nothing came in to replace it. Uh, so that changed Windsor Locks to a, a different thing. So those are the eight I come up with, and I, I, uh, I use it and figure out what to do with the book. But I also hope it makes you think about the history of Winslow Locks and think about what were the causes that, that, that made things happen here, there, and the other way. It's a, it's, a, it's, a fun, it's a fun question. Well, when I was, uh, uh, I, I wasn't new to history when I started this in 2016. Uh, when I was a freshman in college in 1960, uh, I was a math major, Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. And uh, they told me I had to take a history course. And uh, I walked in, and there was this big class. And this lady stood up, and she said, you thought this was going to be a course on Western a survey of Western European history. She said, it sort of is. But I think differently than most people. She said, I believe that when you read history, you have no idea what you're reading. You have no idea that when you read this article you're reading, okay, that the person who wrote it had a great deal of freedom in what, what they were going to put down, okay? And it would be good for you to get a feeling for how much freedom a historian has. So every month you're going to write two papers on history. <laughs> that was the hardest course I've taken in my entire life. I put more work into that than you would believe. And uh, a lot of the students just hated this. Who um, was very good. But I tell you what, she said, practice, 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 you'll get it. She said, your first ones are hard, your fifth one, you know, you'll be much more relaxed, and by the end of the semester, you know, you'll understand what I was talking about. She was right. And when I started writing this stuff, you know, I, I realized, I said, what am I getting, you know, what, I said, I want a chapter on the early ice cream stores of Windsor High <laughs> <laughs> okay. How many other people would do that? <laughs> I had some flexibility and I, I took it. And the reason I did ice cream stores was I've always thought that with that once the had a love affair with ice cream, pizza, and hoagies. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and so part of the nature of Winslow to me was that. And so I uh, I put that in there. 
Uh, and I had a lot of fun doing it. And of course, I had some family interest in it, and I knew others who had ice cream stores. Not that they were ice cream stores. They were more general stores, but uh, that's the result of that. So that, that course that I took uh, in 1960 affected me uh, a great deal. The, the, the professor said, when you do this, be aware. There's one thing you've got to do. If you don't list the sources that you use, it's an F. It's an automatic F. Anytime you see something that doesn't list sources, it's not a history paper. It may well be true, but it's not a history paper. No sources, no history. You got it? Yeah. No, no sources, you fail. Oof. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, there's two reasons to use sources. One, we all tend to get sloppy at times. <laughs> but if you have to show where you got information, then you can't get sloppy. Okay. And the other thing is, someone can check on you. She said, rarely do people check on an author. But oftentimes, they'd like more information, and they can go to where you got the information. So that's what I learned. Now, I worked uh, you know, 40 years in aerospace, uh, and uh, all in science and technology. And so whenever we did a study, I had to write up, whether you do, a, you do a study, you have to write up the history of the technology up to the point where you're doing your study. Okay? I wrote up a lot of history in 40 years. <laughs> but it was all science and technology, so I had never done anything like a talent before. But I did have uh, I did have a lot of experience right, writing history, so I had, a, I had a start. So you stop think. It's hard to think back, but back in uh, the 1960s, when you did a history paper or any kind of paper, where did you go? Went to the library. What did you use? Hard catalog. Look <laughs> up the topic. Okay, you went to find the books, but somebody already took them out. <laughs> yeah. And so you were limited to the books you had, you know, close by, and some of them were already gone. And you had to read those darn things, okay? Well, in 1980s, uh, the internet came through, and the uh, internet changed everything. I mean, now you can find everything that's in almost every library in the world. You can write the history of some small town in, uh, in Spain. It, really, and truly. Uh, it's, it's all changed now. So, uh, but not everything is on the web. I mean, in Winterlocks, there's still stuff which is in the town halls, which you, know, you, have, to, you have to go there to get. But other than that, almost everything is, is, is on the web. So that affected how I did, uh, how I did the book. Uh, by the way, we all use history a lot more than we think. Anybody ever buy anything from Amazon? <laughs> when you buy something at Amazon, you look and you say, okay, this is a, you know, take your pick, this is a uh, clothes washer, or this is a, a, whatever it is, and you look and you see what people said about this over the past four or five years. So, uh, we use, we use a lot of history in, uh, in what we do all the time. It's available to us now in ways that it wasn't available before. And uh, that's, 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 that's kind of cool, kind of cool. Uh, you also learn now that there's so much on the web, not all of it's true. <laughs> and you also learn that some of those things you find on Amazon were, were written by, I used to say, people who were paid to write it. But if you, if you look up this chainsaw that you want to buy, and you saw that this uh, chainsaw has uh, 1,500 you know, responses, and three quarters of them say that it breaks after a year, I would buy a different chainsaw. So there's still good information there. Okay? And now I think we're getting into this age where uh, uh, people say fake news, okay? And fake news is everywhere. It's on Facebook, everywhere. I fell for three of them over the past 10 years. I don't any more, I think, okay? Someone said, take this test. We can tell you what your highest grade was in, in, in school, okay? Another one, we can tell you what your IQ was here. So, these were bots. They wanted information on you, and they got it. Okay, and so you really got to watch. And uh, I, uh, I was trying to find out why is fake news so interesting. And I read an article, and a person says it's easy. Okay, come up with any fact. All right, tell me the fact, and in five minutes I'll generate an alternative story. Okay, about that, which is much more interesting. <laughs> So it's just more interesting, okay? Mm -hmm. More true, just more interesting. So a lot of alternative stuff gets past the fact or fast. So I had, a f I had fun one day. I took a picture of Main Street, Windsor Locks. 
I think it's Serpent Spaceship. <laughs> <laughs> there was a flying saucer. So, no, I didn't figure this would fool anybody. <laughs> but it generated a lot of interest. <laughs> so it was one tiny little speck that alternative realities are, you know, can be more interesting than real realities. <laughs> and uh, I apologize to anybody I fooled. <laughs> Uh, okay, so we think about uh, where do we go on, where do we go to collect information? And the first is the most obvious place, Google, or if you use Bing or something like that, but I think most of us use Google. And Google searches more than anything, you can't find anything, it's big, it searches all sorts of stuff. You can come up with 10, 15,000 responses in six seconds. A lot of them are useful, you pick the ones that are most useful. So whenever I research anything, the first place I go is Google. And uh, for instance, uh, someone said, you never did the Lillian shop. Oh. <laughs> oh, there's someone here in the <laughs> crowd. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I, I had some fun, and uh, this is after the book came out. And uh, I couldn't find much. I looked up Lillian shop, and on uh, the Winslow Ox Journal, website, you could find William Shop, I found lots of uh, advertisements. But they stopped a lot of year earlier than William Shop was around. Okay, I, I knew that. W what happened here? William changed the name, the spelling of the name Shop from S-H-O-P-P-E oh, to yeah. S-H-O-P halfway through her book, or halfway through her, you know, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> once you knew that, you could look up the rest of the story. <laughs> Uh, so it's not a, you know, you got to use a bunch of tricks, and uh, you do, and you, you, you figure out, you change spellings, you do other things, you know. Uh, and when you're sick of that, you've done a, a bunch of it. Uh, now, some things can't be found. Somebody said, what do you know about, does anybody know about a hosiery company in Winslow? Rams. Rams, hosiery. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I challenge you all to go forth. <laughs> Look on all the websites and see what you can find about Rand Hosier, okay? It turns out, if you look in the Winslow Life Journal, you'll find all sorts of ads. They put ads in there <laughs> every week, okay? Try and find out much about the people who owned it. I found out his name, and I found out her name, and I found out they don't exist in the U.S. census anywhere, okay? These people live off the grid. <laughs> so, uh, there are places where you run into a roadblock. I wonder if they were generally in Windsor. Hmm? There was a Rams in Windsor. A Rams in Windsor? Yeah, right on, right on 75. I will look that up. Yeah. But uh, anyway, so you, you see, we get, you, you can talk to people, you find other things. They had a side business. Yeah, they, they were did. Their side business. The side, I've heard about the side business. Interesting stuff. I understand. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I couldn't find anything to attribute the that to. The police knew about Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I talked to a person who used to be a policeman, and he told me about that. But since I can't source that, I can't run it. <laughs> but it turns out, one thing that I do know from people who spoke to them often was that uh, they were both, the husband and wife, were very quiet. They didn't talk a lot. Right? The lady said, I used to want to be a nun. I was going to train to become a nun. But she said, I, I, I married him instead. Uh, and uh, the last thing I found was that he was found with, this is in an article, uh, a good deal of stolen, stolen stuff. But there are places you just went into a, a blank wall. Okay. So once you've been through uh, Google, the next place to go is obviously the Winslow Journal Archive. And uh, you you'll find there's different, different ways you can put a, a thing in. You can type in one place, Lillian Shop, and it'll find every place that says Lillian's, every place that says Shop, okay? Mm -hmm. You can go to another place where it only takes the whole thing, Lillian Shop, okay? Mm -hmm. And so I tend to go to the one that, where it takes the whole thing. But you know, I, I change it around. So have fun with your family, your background, you know, yourself, and look yourself up in the Winslow Locks Journal you might find some, some interesting things. Uh, the, the, the next one I have is, I don't find it as useful anymore. I used, I used to use the Harvard Current a lot. Uh, and the Harvard Current has some stuff, and there's 
Springfield newspapers, like the Republican, mm -hmm. that they all had every day Windsor Locks news and all over town, right? And so those those are very good. But I found something better than using uh, the Harvard Current, uh, which uh, I was able to get into their archive. There's another thing called newspapers.com, right? And newspapers.com and uh, genealogybank.com in one fell swoop go through all of the nation's major newspapers. So you can type in Willie and Sean, and it'll go through all the major newspapers, uh, and it'll tell you what's there. For a lot of people in Windsor Locks, all you're going to get is what's here in town. But you get somebody like Harry Broussier. <coughs> I, 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 I never answer a question when I ask you. I don't mean it for you to stick your hand up in very no. Harry Broussier owned the Windsor Locks Hotel for a while. And as, as I've learned a lot about Windsor Locks sports figures, I think, I'm going to write him up, I think he was probably Windsor Locks' biggest sports uh, person. Uh, he was into sulky racing, and he was nationally known, maybe internationally known. When I looked him up, his obituary was in most states in the Union. I mean, wow. he, he was known everywhere. So if you're looking up somebody like him, you can use uh, newspapers.com or genealogybank.com, and you get them all at the same time. Uh, I started, by the way, I have, they're all here at the websites. So uh, uh, I found that I liked genealogybank.com. Now, that one in newspapers.com, you can sign up for a week and get it for free. And that's good. But after that, it's probably going to cost you 50, 60 bucks a year. And if you're, if you're having fun with this, 60 bucks a year is peanuts for what you get. Uh, I, I just love it. Genealogy Bank not only gives you all the major newspapers in the world, but it gives you, you know, death indices, birth indices, uh, you know, uh, uh, a lot of genealogical stuff. And so that's one search. <laughs> all this stuff pops out. And it tells you what category it's under. So I, I learned to really like genealogy websites, especially genealogybank.com. But I get nothing for saying this. Somebody want to say something? <laughs> Um, I also use, uh, I don't use Ancestry.com because I, I can't afford to have three or four of these things, but that's a very good one. And FamilySearch.org is a, a very good one. Family Search is uh, from Utah, uh, it's the Mormons. Uh, it's free and it's absolutely wonderful. You can look up all sorts of good stuff. And uh, why would you want to look up that studying Windsor Locks history? Well, we're studying Ray LaRusso. You can't call us family up all the time. <laughs> So, you know, I said, I'll look, him up, I'll look up his genealogy. Sure enough, I found his mother and father. I found when they came back. He, went, he came over from Italy, when he went back, and came back with his wife, and, you know, all this stuff. <laughs> so it's all in the genealogy websites on, on Ray Roncari. And so I got that. And from that, I could ask better questions. And so genealogy websites uh, are fun. I've done a lot of genealogy. But it fits very well together with doing Winslow Act research. Uh, what happened here? There's something else. Yeah, we're, we're getting close, close to the end of this. Now, there's a, a bunch of uh, historical associations. Windsor Locks has a Windsor Locks Historical Society. Connecticut has a Connecticut Historical Society. There's a bunch of these, and they all have very good websites which are tuned to their needs, and uh, they're free. And uh, I use them. I've gotten to know them, so I know when to go where for, for my needs. I don't use them as much as I use the others, but they're, they're very, very, very good. And then, websites of Windsor Locks History Archives. Uh, we have Jerry Darty here today. <laughs> Jerry Darty's website is, uh, I use it all the time. Need pictures? There he is. Um, and, you know, documents. Uh, that's good stuff. Uh, Great stuff. And he worked, took him a lot of the, or time to organize all this. And when you find someone who's a, a, a uh, historical librarian, you've been helped. <laughs> uh, there's a, another one, which I think is, is really fun. Look it up. It's the uh, Win Windsor Locks Sports uh, Hall of Fame. Okay, there's Windsor Locks Sports Hall of Fame. Looked up like that. And Phil Devlin is the one who uh, has written it up. And there's maybe 100 people in it. And they're noted, you know probably all the names. Uh, so on each person that's in it, there's one page right up, their life, and there's a photo. And it's a, that's a fun archive. I mean, 
Sometimes I go to that and just read about four or five more people. But if you're looking up people, Windsor Lock Sports Hall of Fame has some good stuff in it. Um, and, uh, oh, the one you can't forget for Windsor Locks is who wrote more Windsor Locks articles than anybody else? Jack Green, Edmund Goldhunter, from 1975 to 2000. Okay. Absolutely right. wonderful stuff. Uh, what I hope to see somebody write, maybe someone from the uh, middle school, <laughs> but anybody, but if the history of Windsor Locks from you know, 75 to 2000, what a wonderful place to start, Jack, uh, Jack's columns. Uh, and if you go there, and you should, they're in the Windsor Locks, uh, the public library site, and you can look up uh, you know, many of the ones you want. Look up the first one and the last one. So, uh, I've quoted them a couple times and got me in trouble. People disagree. <laughs> yeah. uh, in the first one, uh, he said, what I'm going to write about is uh, people. I find that people like to read about other people more than they like anything else. And they like to about read about people who have made their mark. So he said, I'm going to write about people who have made their mark. So that tells you about the type of people that he wrote about, and that makes it really interesting. Then, at the end, he said something which not everybody wanted to hear. He said, I'm not finished writing, but I'm finished writing this column. No. He said, uh, it's not the exact words, but they're close. He said, um, I used to have a long list of people that I wanted to interview, but my list now is very short. Maybe he was getting tired, <laughs> but he had some very interesting comments. And his way of writing, I love. He was completely, I mean, he just wrote. He got it out. He was uh, easy to read. He was just, he's just really, really good. And uh, the last one, some people disagree with, but Wikipedia. You look up any town in the world and look up Wikipedia, Windsor Locks, whoosh, wonderful information. You know, how many people were in Windsor Locks at every decade? There's, and they're pretty short, they're to the point, and uh, they're, they're pretty well done. Wikipedia has one on the canal, one on the railroad station, one, so I, I use that. Those are the ones I use. What I really do, when I start a new project, like William Shop, <laughs> I open up a, a I, I make a folder, William Shop, and then I open up uh, the Google searches, uh, the uh, Windsor Lux journals, I look up genealogybank.com and uh, maybe two or three others. I go back and forth between those and look stuff up. And those are the ones I mostly use, but I use all of these, and I hope you find, you find them useful. So where does all of this get there? What, why, do we, why do we study? Why do we study this? Why do we have? There's lots of reasons. One is it's fun. It's fun to think about when we were young. It's fun to think, you know, about uh, going down to Wuzzy Suits. One of my thrills was, uh, after I got the first set of books out, I heard back from Steve Warren, and I, I, I never met the man. But he said, well, he said, I found your book wonderful. I read the first chapter, and he said, the memory is just kept coming out of my head. I saw the dump. <laughs> <I saw the, laughs> all those old places. So it, it, nothing wrong with the, uh, a little bit of uh, reverie and going back and thinking about where we were. Uh, it it's also allows us to think about uh, where we want to go. It helps you stand on the shoulders of the people who came before. You can learn a lot. You can, you can see things that happened before. And uh, you can make new mistakes rather than the same old ones. And so the real reason you, you do history, I do history, a lot of people do, is uh, it's fun, it's interesting, but it, it helps you see things in perspective. What do I mean by that? I, I'm not BS. This is really true. Say your car won't start. What you want to do is to take it to a person who has done a lot of cars. <laughs> you want a person with a lot of perspective. You've got someone who's repaired 2,000 cars. He's got a lot of history. <laughs> and the more things he's seen that don't start, the more experience he's got in figuring how to start your car. So uh, experience gives you context. Context makes you, makes you uh, better at figuring out what's wrong and how to get there. It doesn't give you the answers, but it gives you a leg up. So I have a few other thoughts, but what the heck, I've been going at this a, a long time, and you know, maybe you need a, a break and 
<laughs> you want to? Anybody have any any questions or thoughts? Something you want to throw at me? <laughs> uh, tomato, 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 tomato. <laughs> Actually, uh, sure. In your research, did you find anything out about Windsor Locks that you didn't know or that really surprised you? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can't. You can't not. Uh, you also find stuff that you, you can't put down, that you shouldn't put down, because someone called you up and said, so-and-so did this, and you, know, you, you have no way of knowing and stuff like that. But, um, you know, I, I didn't know as... Uh, I hadn't read much about the early history of Winslow Locks, so a lot of that you know, was, was, was new to me, and that was fun, reading about the early settlers. Um, and uh, I didn't know the history of the canal, and the history of the canal is just phenomenal. I mean, that was probably the most difficult chapter to write, except that many. <laughs> you know, How many Seth Dexters? <laughs> yeah. He kept saying, no, which Seth, Seth Dexter is this? Which Seth Dexter did that? And uh, we went back and forth. Right. Yeah. Uh, so that, uh, that the whole thing of figuring out what happened on the, with the canal and the, the uh, I had not thought about it. it was across the whole United States that this happened. That, you know, mills and manufacturing went up and then came down again. And when you think about the future, by the way, I don't do politics, <laughs> I don't want to get into politics, right? But uh, when you think about uh, bringing back jobs, uh, I'm biased. I, I worked for about 15 years in robotics. And so I, I know a little bit about robotics. A lot of manufacturing is going to come back to the United States, there's no doubt about it. But that doesn't mean that a lot of manufacturing jobs are coming back to the, to the United States. Okay? I was thinking about the other day, I went up in an elevator. Remember when you used to go to G. Fox, when you go to Steigers, you know, you sit second floor. Yeah. <laughs> it was someone who got you to each floor, right? You don't want to bring back people who, you know, op who operators and operate do it yourself, okay? Uh, I would guess that in no more than five or six years, uh, McDonald's isn't going to have people making hamburgers. You know, they're going to come out automatically. More and more is going to be done automatically, right? So you're going to say, this is a shame. Okay? It's a shame. But there's nothing you can do about it. You can't bring back elevator operators, okay? So there's a lesson there for the kids. You know, if you're going to study something and prepare for the world, my, my suggestion is to prepare for something that has a lot of fluidity. In other words, you can do this, you can do that, you can do the other thing. What you want is a calling card so you can do you can build a number of things. And you don't want to build buggy whips. <laughs> that don't like buggy whips anymore. So uh, that's... that's that's an, that's an important one. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Just a question. When you did the history um, part, you know, or even when you were just reading about it, did you find like that in the Indian settlers, like back in the 1600s, I remember, don't ask me why the name, the time 1622 sticking out in my head for whatever I was reading. But um, my husband was from like the Delaware Circle, you know, side of town. And that family, you know, one of the streets were named, and it had something to do with the Indians. And I was curious, did you find anything out a lot about Indians and settlers? I, I, I read a lot of stuff. There, there are people in this room who know infinitely more than, than I do about this. Uh, there would be Bill Fournier, there would be Mickey Denver, there would be others. You know, if, if uh, I... If I had to say what was the thing I knew more about than anything else, it's uh, Windsor Locks from 1900 to 1975. When my grandparents came here, and you know, all four of them came to Windsor Locks uh, and uh, did their thing. So I, it brings up an interesting point. I, I talked to Bill about this earlier. Uh, so uh, I don't know if you remember wait a minute, the book by uh, Jabez, <laughs> the wonderful little book. And he says in the beginning, I didn't, he said, he didn't use sources for this book. There was no newspapers to go to, uh, you know, for the old days. He got it from his parents, his grandparents, his aunts and uncles, who got it from their parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles, okay? And this is called oral history. There are a lot of tribes in the world who, that's all they have is oral history. They didn't have a written language, okay? So what, what's, what's the problem with oral history? Well, it's not a problem. The best you got, all right? But my mother's parents gave me, gave my mother, 
with about six or seven hundred pictures, photographs, okay? And my mother gave them to me. And uh, I scanned them and put information on the bottom that I got from her. So suppose I did an oral history. I got, I got a lot of photographs and stories from both the Montemarillo side and the Colopetro side. And I could easily have written that up. I still could. There's a problem. Only people in those pictures and the only people in those stories were Italians. <laughs> ah, you say. Now, I'm not knocking anybody. I'm not saying anything. I'm just saying it's absolutely true. <laughs> all the pictures from my grandparents were all about, you know, their friends and relatives and they're all Italian. And it really wouldn't do me good to, to write a history of so I was all about Italians. <laughs> By the way, there was an Italian. I told Bill this and his wife this jokes. There's not many Windsor Watch jokes, but one of my favorites was back from the days before political correctness when you could do, you know, ethnic jokes. I love those days. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody ever felt bad. You know, I never saw a fight in Windsor Locks, you know, about, you know, me versus your, your, your versus my game. But there was a, a wonderful old joke from back then where it goes like this. And by the way, you can tell it two ways. Right? You, could, you could put either ethnic group first. And then you can throw in other groups, like you say. So, there's this place in Windsor Locks where there was a, the Italian American uh, society. And the Polish National Society was just a little farther up the street. And on, on Saturday night, sometimes there was some drinking going on. <laughs> and so. Uh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, there was never any real trouble. But there were a couple of incidents. Really? Give me an incident. Well, one time those Polish folks came over to where we were, the Italian-American society, and they threw firecrackers at us. Really? What'd you do? Well, we lit them and threw them back. <laughs> I told that to my good friend Marty Sokolowski at, uh, at NASA, and the next day it came back as a Polish job. <laughs> and you can throw in the French, you can throw in you know, any what you want. But, uh, so they, the, uh, how do you say, that's another thing I remember growing up, you know, everybody was first or second generation, uh, oh, yeah. and uh, I, I never noticed any hard feelings, any bad feelings, that was, that was just cool stuff. <laughs> there is one other Windsor Locks joke, which is even worse than that one. Uh, <laughs> you may not even get it. Well, uh, so, it, it's not true anyway. <laughs> so I was fishing, four of us were fishing down in the river, and we were, uh, uh, we got there about 8 in the morning, and, uh, how did it go? Uh, we were fishing for carp, and so we had the waders on, we were out at 8 at noon, no carp, we caught nothing. So I said, look, let's go out and get something to eat, let's just get rid of this. So we're getting out, I'm taking, the, taking my waders off, I reached back, looking for my wallet, no wallet. Oh, you know how you feel when you get out your wallet? <laughs> So I look back toward the water, and I see two carp jumping out of the water. And one of them has my wallet in his mouth. <laughs> Gets a little hairy here. <laughs> and flips it to the other carp, and they both go down. They come back up again, three times, they back and forth. Best example of carp the carp walloting I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> carp the carp walloting, wall the wall carp. <laughs> There's not a lot of good ones on so. <laughs> But those are two fun ones. Feel free to pass them on. A couple other thoughts that uh, that hit me when I was when I was doing this was uh, when, when I do a when I do a project, say when I start uh, the thing on take uh, a pick on uh, Wuzzies when I started, I made a folder called Wuzzies. Everything I downloaded went into the folder, and I made one page. And every time I took something, I put it on a page, and so on. I knew where I had been, and if I had any notes on where, where I wanted to go, I, they're there too. So I always keep this running thing, I can always go back to it. So when I'm doing a, a big project, uh, making a one-page ongoing summary is a, a fun thing. Um, it, it was one other thing, it's kind of, kind of uh, interesting uh, when you think of uh, Towns. There are towns uh, across the United States and everywhere in the world that have signs as you go into them. You know? Petersburg, West Virginia, home of the largest rocking chair in West Virginia. <laughs> and 
you know, every town has got one or two or three or four of these. And I did some, some research into them, and none of them take it very seriously. It's, 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 it's pure fun. So one of them I remember about Windsor Locks was, Windsor Locks is the only town in the United States with a one-sided main street. Well, Mary Beth and I were lucky enough to go to Maui. And in Maui, we went to this uh, one town called Lahaina. Walked down the line is Main Street. One side is all the little stores. The other is the sea. There are two, two towns in the United States that have one-sided Main Street. So things like this are, are in general not, not taken. We were first. We were first. Yeah, we were first. Those are kind of fun. Uh, another is, uh, this is, this, this came up earlier in, in conversation at dinner time. If you're writing ancient history, you can write anything you want. The relatives, they're not alive anymore. <laughs> if you're writing the history of New York City, you can pick any person you want. You'll never find them, they'll never find you, okay? Try and write the history of Windsor Locks and do it. <laughs> you can't do it. All small town history is personal. And this is well written. You can find it all over the web. People who have, you know, come across this. And it was one lady who was uh, near where we were in Burke, Virginia. And uh, she was a professional historian. She taught. She was a professor of history in a small town. And uh, they asked her to head up the uh, historical society, which means she had to take over their small, um, what you call it, museum. And they used to donate all sorts of stuff to the museum. And she said a lot of this was just junk. <laughs> you can't tell someone who wants to donate, you know, their, their mother's most precious possessions. <laughs> junk. <laughs> and so what what you learn about is that history in small towns really is tricky business. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting stuff. And another thing she, she wrote was she put together this display. And display talked about something that happened 150 years ago in the town. And it was about a guy who did something bad. And when the people came in to see it, one lady yelled out, take it down, you can't put that up there. And she said, why not? She said, the purpose of history is to support our town. Oh, wait a minute, that's the Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> okay, so you do get this slight conflict once in a while, not big, but you know, it's interesting to know. Oh, no question. And you stayed awake at everything I said. <laughs> uh, anyway, that, that's a lot of fun. The last thing that's interesting is psychologists have a word called ethnocentrism. I'm not going to spell it for you. Ethnocentrism means I think this way, therefore everybody should, <laughs> or everybody does. That's, that's often not the case. So if you think, uh, so a good one is uh, Christmas trees. Okay. If I say putting up a Christmas tree, you close your eyes, you picture mom and dad and three kids putting up the trees, you know, and uh, everything is good and fun and it's, it's cool stuff. And one of the kids is putting too many stuff on one bow and you say, you put some over there, right? But that's what, if you look up the history of, of Christmas traditions in the United States, what you find out is prior to 1840, Christians in the United States pretty much thought, did think, that this is across America, that, uh, Christmas trees were a pagan tradition from Europe, okay? And if you put up a Christmas tree, you'd be ready for, you know, for bad feelings with the neighbors, okay? Mostly, when we start thinking about that, we don't think about that things might have been thought differently back then. So I first learned this one, so with history of the Bible, or <laughs> to get some Bible research. One time, this professor said, you know, a lot of things we say now, when they were said back then, meant something completely different. So when you're doing this stuff, you gotta go back and find out what they meant, not what you, not what you like. So those are some of the things that uh, I learned going through. I probably poured you to tears. No, but this, uh, this uh, as I think of the things I've done in my life, uh, a lot of them turned out well, a lot of them didn't. I think this turned out, turned out well. But it also turned out to me to be very satisfying because I made so many friends and gotten so much, uh, you know, I've met so many people over the web and met so many old friends now that I had back in those days. So I really enjoyed doing it. Thank you for coming tonight. Well, thank you. I would be remiss. I didn't recognize a couple of ladies. Mary Beth Montemurlo. 
Annie, my significant other, for the support that they give us during our hours and hours and hours of what can be to them boring research. <laughs> However, we're clothed, we're fed, the bills are paid. Thank you, ladies. This way or something. There's three or four batches coming up. This is what I said tonight. They're the two lists. Hey, Bill. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. And, uh, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. 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 Thank